All right, we're going to call to order the October 5th meeting of the West Sacramento City Council and Redevelopment Agency, the Successor Agency and Financing Authority. We're going to begin tonight as we do each week with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'd like to enjoy, invite our guests to join the council and staff in the pledge, uh, which tonight's going to be led by Ms. Lynn Arner. The council did meet in closed session this evening to confer with our real property negotiator uh, regarding negotiations with the West Sacramento Area Flood Control Agency, the personal number noted in the agenda, and to confer with our legal counsel regarding one item of substantial exposure to litigation. No action was taken. That brings us to item 1A, which is presentations by the public <coughs> on matters not on the agenda but within the jurisdiction of the city council. As is noted on our agenda, uh, the council is precluded by state law from voting or having a discussion about items that are brought up under item 1A, uh, but it is an important opportunity for a public forum. We ask that anyone wishing to address the council on item 1A or any other item this evening to please fill out one of the yellow cards. It's available near the front door and turn it into the city clerk. In front of the clerk is a timer that we use to make sure that everyone gets a chance to be heard. And so to that uh, end, we ask that all comments be limited to no more than three minutes. Also in front of the clerk is a flip chart, and that simply indicates which agenda item we're, we're currently considering. We take the yellow cards all the way up to the conclusion of the staff report on any particular agenda item. So if we're here to speak on, on agenda item 11 or 12, but just be sure to turn in your uh, speaking card uh, before the staff has completed their report on that agenda item. Once the council questions and discussion and the public testimony have begun, we don't take any additional speaking requests. We also recognize that for some folks, speaking in public can uh, cause anxiety and hives and all sorts of other bad things. And so we do ask that there not be any uh, boos or cat calls or even any um, applause or other demonstrations and we try to maintain a civil discourse here in the chambers. So with that, we have no um, requests to speak under item 1A, so we're going to proceed to item 1B, which is council communications. Are there any reports or other communications this evening? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sandine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Port Commission met earlier tonight and we approved a budget appropriation for technical consultation services related to phase two of the Yolo Rail realignment project. And we also approved an exclusive ne negotiating agreement between the Port and Ranch Capital LLC for purchase and development of the Barge Canal property. I also participated in a YOLO LAFCO organized summit on sustainable transportation in YOLO County last week, and we heard speakers from UC Davis, Caltrans, YOLO County, SACOG, and YOLO County Transit. Transit Transportation District. Um, our city manager also presented an update of our city's transportation plan and the state of our roads and funding issues related to our roads. And several West Sac staff members participated, including our fire chief and director of public works. Um, I also attended the same day in the morning, the Business Journal's best, uh, best of real estate projects breakfast program and two West Sac projects were uh, recognized the Park Moderns and Habitat received the best residential project of the year, and the Washington Firehouse received the best adaptive reuse project of the year. Uh, the City of West Sacramento also received commendations from both project leaders and uh, the su at, for support and staffing excellence of our city team and for our council's vision. So we were called out. Um, it was a really proud moment. Actually, we're, of, of the nine projects, four actually were in Yolo County and two were here in West Sacramento. And then, um, just a, like a week and a half ago, Councilmember Johannesson and I both attended the Tower Bridge dinner, and another proud time for West Sacramento. There were two two chefs that I think presented appetizers at the big event: Ernesto Delgado and Chris Jaraz. I always say his name wrong. Um, <laughs> what is it? How do you say it? Yaros. 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 I need I need help with his name. And then two of our farmers, um, the Watanabes, not Watanabes, and um, also Del Rio Botanical. They also provided um, but, uh, produce for the evening, and then two of our breweries, Yolo Brewing Company and Jackrabbit. So we had West Sacramento was nicely represented there. And then finally, um, on Monday, I participated in a discussion regarding uh, Yolo County Champions for Children's Agenda, along with um, Lynn Arner of our Up for West Sac team, and then our first five representative, Francisco Castillo, he co-led the discussion. And we discussed the need for more funding for first five programs and services generally, but we also, and we also spoke with potential funders um, as kind of a first step to talk about programming for 
um, early education and preschool in the county. And representatives from Yolo County, uh, all the school districts, the cities, the uh, Yochidehi, Winta Nation, corporations and foundations all participated in the, the roundtable discussion. Thanks. Great, thank you. Any other reports this evening? I had uh, uh, two. First, uh, at the Sacramento Area Council of Governments, uh, we announced last week the appointment of our new uh, chief executive officer and executive director. Uh, and I think I mentioned this at our last last meeting as well. James Corliss from the from Transportation for America will be starting in April as the new CEO uh, uh, for for the regional organization. So we're very excited about that appointment. And then uh, last week I was at the. Um, uh, uh, leadership meeting for the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Oklahoma City, uh, and uh, a couple of uh, uh, key items from that meeting. Uh, we had an extensive uh, working session on autonomous vehicles uh, in cities and some, uh, certainly some of the implications, uh, but also some of the design and planning infrastructure and finance considerations uh, to be dealt with. And we've talked about this you know, fairly extensively um, at the council, uh, you know, and off and on in, in our innovation discussion and the charter discussion and in the uh, general plan review as well. Uh, but actually a very useful session with uh, uh, folks from the, the, Department, uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation just released um, their guidance on autonomous vehicles. And we also had Salita Reynolds, who's the head of the L.A. Department of Transportation, and they're quite far along um, in, their, uh, in their planning. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the I, I guess one of the constant questions that kept coming up from from my colleagues around the rest of the country were so when is when is this happening when are autonomous vehicles coming and you know is that going to be in 2022 or in 2020 you can imagine my answer was they're already here um, that you know that, that we have they started with uh, cruise control um, but there are plenty of uh, vehicles that are already largely autonomous on the roads today and that's coming even further um, that prompted the LA um, general manager to point out um, that there's a raging debate about which I was unaware that the council might be interested in between um, uh, around whether or not to focus on the, the incremental build towards autonomous vehicles, which is the trajectory that we're largely on, um, or, uh, and that, that you know, companies like, like Tesla and many of the major auto companies are focused on, um, or the, uh, the leap immediately to what we're called level four autonomous vehicles, so those vehicles that don't require a driver, uh, don't anticipate the availability of a driver at all. Whereas a level three autonomous vehicle doesn't require a driver, um, but uh, in the event that something goes wrong, it can alert the driver and the driver takes control. Uh, and there is a, but there, which is the preferred approach for the, for the auto companies. They have uh, you know, widely different implications for safety and also around, well, could you, if, could you actually count on the human being at that point who's now disengaged? Um, but the implications that we've talked about for parking and for street width, uh, are, 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 were certainly highlighted and uh, for decisions around road widenings and what to do when you're doing road, road, road repavings for um, markers in the road that can, can assist with the, with the regulated area of autonomous vehicles and also the ideal areas to begin now uh, with autonomous vehicles, um, the ideal neighborhood types um, and places. Uh, uh, that to focus on so some guidance around what, how cities in their in their general planning processes um, could identify areas that are more appropriate um, than <coughs> others for different kinds of autonomous vehicles with the re with the recognition and I think this was universal across all of all of the experts that we heard from that uh, the, it's it, the, there's there's really no question that it's in an, in, an inevitable change and an inevitable change very fast. Uh, you know, with, with certainly within this deck, within within the within the, the whatever this is called, the teens, <laughs> um, um, and uh, we would ignore it at our peril. And, that, uh, and particularly, a lot of our financing mechanisms that, and infrastructure financing and other sorts of things that we have not paid attention to uh, mostly are also going to have to be on the table. So, um, the so uh, and, and uh, I should say the last piece of it was the workforce implications. We've talked about wouldn't it be great if you didn't need parking spaces and and uh, if a, uh, you know and some of the implications around transit. Uh, but the potential, um, uh, you know, utter disruption of the of jobs for um, taxi drivers, to be sure, but parking lot attendants, uh, truck drivers, bus drivers, uh, large, large swaths of job classifications all at once. Um, in addition to creating, you know, lots and lots and lots of jobs in the technology and engineering and other sorts of things as well. Um, but the but the amount of disruption could make the whole Uber era, you know, seem like it was. Uh, 
smooth and easy. So, so uh, since I chair the jobs committee for the for the conference of mayors, uh, I'm going to be part of a national task force on on uh, trying to come up with some best practices and and uh, guidance for cities, but also then recommendations to Congress and to the next administration around uh, what cities need in order to effectively adapt and, and where we're going to need some support, frankly, from, from higher levels of government. Uh, and also, because the federal government is particularly interested in making sure that an autonomous vehicle that works and functions in California or in West Sacramento can just as e can can not have to worry about crossing over into Davis or or uh, or Nevada and not and no longer no longer be legal. Um, and so there's definitely an interest in starting to harmonize from the beginning uh, some of the regulatory uh, regimes. So long report, but that was a, a, it's a very significant issue and one that was a, a, high, a, a big focus of the Conference of Mayors. The other one I wanted to highlight, although we, we also heard from the presidential campaigns and had some extensive uh, work uh, that we were doing on water, uh, water quality and wastewater systems, the other major issue is flood. Um, and uh, I pushed pretty hard and got agreement from the mayors that we will, uh, as the uh, for their support on our, what we're trying to do with respect to the Water Resources uh, Development Act in terms of um, the authorizations of projects that have a chief's report complete, like ours. Um, and in addition to some of the issues around the FEMA, uh, FEMA has, re has recently released some proposed uh, regulations, some proposed rulemaking, and it is, I, I think the whole council was, a, I think you were here, Mayor Pro Tem, sitting with us, uh, at least in the last round of this um, issue around um, floodplain uh, management. Just to recall, the Nixon administration had um, issued an executive order that said that federal agencies were not to make investments, federal investments in, in floodplains. I'm, I'm putting it grossly, but that's pretty much what it said. And uh, uh, that's a ridiculous public policy, given that the, the large, a large proportion of America's population, and particularly city populations, is in floodplains. So it was never really implemented in that when President Obama came into office, um, the White House issued uh, an order uh, reviving that executive order, essentially. We um, cried pretty loudly and also engaged the U.S. Conference of Mayors and other partners, and <coughs> they pulled that back. Uh, the White House pulled that back and, and agreed to take another look um, at the trade-offs associated with saying no investment in, flus in floodplains. And uh, there have been an interagency task force with FEMA and the Corps of Engineers and Homeland Security and us and uh, at the Conference of Mayors and others trying to work through these issues. FEMA, uh, a month, month and a half ago, released its proposed rulemaking on its portion of that executive order that, um, at least in my view, it still goes too far in terms of saying that we're, uh, it's sort of informed by this idea that wouldn't it be great if people just didn't live in floodplains and therefore we can reduce flood risk, we can l reduce flood risk to human life if we just ignore that people live there now and create all the incentives for them not to live there any longer. And um, that's just a, uh, I mean, obviously for West Sacramento it's horrible, but just as a public policy, the idea that uh, people, that, uh, people will just leave the floodplains and move somewhere else ignores that there are plenty of risks to move to the fire zones or to earthquake areas. There are very few risk-free locations uh, to live, um, but floodplain managers are really only interested in, 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 in floodplains. And if, if folks were to move out of West Sacramento and the pocket and downtown Sacramento and other floodplains in the Sacramento region and choose instead to live in Roseville or Galt or elsewhere, the, the impacts on climate change and on sprawl and on air pollution and on physical activity and other things that will also reduce their, 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 their health are pretty severe. So we've made this case pretty consistently, but I think this, the, the FEMA rule right now uh, still goes too far. So uh, uh, we got, got the, the mayors to agree to weigh in on uh, this. We have not weighed in as a city yet, so we'll, we'll, we'll need to do the same thing. Uh, but to, to, uh, to comment on the FEMA rule, the proposed rulemaking for FEMA uh, to make sure that, that this doesn't go, well, it's an appropriate area of focus that it not go so far as to mean that the federal government can't invest in a hospital in West Sacramento or levees in West Sacramento or, or, or highways or streetcar or other projects. So uh, with that, then, if there's no other reports, item 1C is appointments to boards and commissions, and just, just for the council and the clerk, not intending to make any additional appointments, um, since all we have at this point are alternates, not intending to make any additional appointments uh, prior to, the, since all the terms conclude in, uh, after the election anyway, which is only, only a month away. 
for, I'm, I'm sure the mayor pro tem can tell us how many minutes away it is. Um, but so, uh, so I wouldn't anticipate any additional appointments coming forward uh, before that time. All right, we have before us the consent agenda, which is items two through nine. Are there any um, items to remove or any items for separate question or comment? Five. And all right. Then item five is consideration of proposed modifications to the inclusionary housing program. <coughs> mayor pro tem Sandine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just, um, as I was reading the, the item, I just wanted to understand a little bit more about, uh, I understand simplifying the program and I, I'm completely supportive of that. I, I was just wondering what, was happen what would happen to the affordable units, the, home, the, the owned units, what would happen if they went at market rate? Do we, do we still have affordable units available or are they then no longer in the program? Just, I just want to understand a little more. Sure. So as you pointed out, the, the changes that we are proposing would only affect the for sale aspect of our inclusionary housing program. And yes, you are correct. The changes would allow owners uh, upon resale to sell those units at market um, instead of holding them as part of the inclusionary housing program. Now, by doing that, we would also uh, be able to recapture the existing inclusionary housing notes. And we would be looking at other ways to achieve affordable home ownership for low and moderate income households. So the, the key point that I'd like to make about this is that we're not abandoning affordable home ownership. We're just looking for other ways to more efficiently and effectively produce units and allow uh, affordable home ownership. Okay. So if, if, I, uh, if I purchased one of these homes under the under the affordable housing program, uh, it's almost some of these twenty years ago, and I'm now and I'm now selling it for uh, whatever reasonably inflated rate is at that point. What's the do I how much is this? The, are we recapturing through the note or we are recapturing through the note the uh, principal amount of the note. There is also a a shared appreciation portion to that note, so we would also capture a portion of whatever appreciation and value accumulated during the time that that unit initially sold and the new market value of the unit. And what's that? I'm sure it's in the, I'm sure it's in what you gave us, but what's the share of the appreciation or how does uh, it work? The share varies. The share varies depending on the initial um, amount of the note. So each, each uh, unit has a set amount, a principal amount, and based on that principal amount, and the original market value, we set that shared appreciation. So it's going to vary depending on each unit. Okay. So in the example that you gave in the in the staff report about a you know particular sale, what was it, what were the could you describe the numbers there? Like it's the original, the original sale, and how much the the owner, uh, how much appreciation the owner was able to would, so, or would have been able to achieve. So it wasn't, uh, the, the example that we gave uh, was an example of how we had to reduce our existing promissory note to make that resale happen. Again, because of the restrictions on the combined loan to value ratios. Mm -hmm. The units are still sold at, at below market, but they still have to account for our inclusionary note. And that's where we are running into problems when the lenders do their underwriting and they have to account not just for the new first mortgage, which because they are low income buyers, they typically come in at already at 95, 97% right. loan to value. When you add on top of that our notes, it takes the combined loan to values to 120, 130, when those are typically limited at 95, 100 or 105% at the max. So if, but if that was, if that restriction was off, I guess, what, 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 what you might, what magnitude of appreciation, appreciation might you expect from, from some of these sales? It, uh, it could be fairly significant, especially for the low income units. We have, when the program was originally uh, started, we had both low and moderate income units. The moderate income units were priced uh, still lower than market, but not the difference was not as much. It was usually around ten, fifteen thousand dollar difference. The low incomes could be fifty, sixty, seventy, over a hundred thousand dollars. It just depends on when they were originally sold. Um, an example are the the Riva units. The Riva units at 
one point they were priced at over three hundred thousand, and our affordable prices were in the low two hundreds or high hundreds. So you can see the disconnect there and, and why we're having so many issues. So part of the reason I ask about this is that, that we, we, we um, uh, I, I don't think we've done a, no one's done a good job of really accounting for the, um, the wealth effect of, some, of this sort of a program. So, so we're, we're making the changes because we, we have to because it doesn't work otherwise. Um, and that, that, so it all makes sense just for, for itself. Um, but it's also, I mean, for, the, for, for those buyers, to the extent that they have a significant increase in their total amount of wealth and their ability to, you know, finance going to, maybe, you know, maybe for the first time sending a, a child to college or other, other sorts of things that, that increase their level of financial, uh, financial standing. Uh, because it's not part of the affordable housing program itself, uh, we often don't account for that, and we should, um, because it you know you, it is possible that you uh, in, in in a neighborhood or in a community that you have a level of poverty that's here in 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 year one and a level of poverty that's let's lower in year ten, and that may be as a result of displacement and gentrification. It may also be that those 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 poor people from year one are less poor or not poor today, um, and that is that's actually quite a, that's quite a significant. Um, improvement and it's quite a, a, a good accomplishment for a public policy intervention but because our focus is always around uh, around the, the sort of the proportion of, of folks who are in poverty as though it should always be you know it's always the same we, we sometimes miss that so I hope we're we are we're keeping account not like not, not name and social security number but I'm keeping account of the wealth effects that we are having for families who uh, who may who five or ten or fifteen or twenty years ago uh, qualified for low income housing had a very low medium income and are now now able to realize you know potentially a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars worth of appreciation that's not an insignificant um, benefit in terms of of, uh, of the well being and the and the, and reducing um, income and wealth inequality in our community. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions on the consent? Any further discussions? Is there a motion? I'll second. It's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Sandine and seconded by Councilmember Ledesma. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. That motion carries. The consent agenda is adopted. Item 10 is consideration of resolution 16-60 uh, for exception to the 180-day wait period for hiring a retiree as temporary extra help employee. Mr. Laurel. Okay, so I'm like the fourth string staff person on this report, but uh, <laughs> how did this get to you? You're always first string. I'm, I'm Moonlight is an Are HR there person. only four people in administrative services? <laughs> <laughs> so this item is only necessary to be on the regular agenda because of a PERS rule that uh, if it's within 180 days, you bring back an annuitant, has to be on the regular agenda. So um, Mr. Cars is the subject of this report, and we're, we are hoping to bring him back as an annuitant to work um, mainly on uh, some needs at the port. He uh, is one of the only people that understands the port's intricacies in terms of the electrical system. Um, there's a training opportunity also with new is there staff. An objection to, is there a motion on this? I mean, you're required to present it under, in not in a, on a consent item, I suppose, but we're not required to have it an extensive. No, uh, right. No, that, okay, that was so only moved by you, Mr. Johannes and seconded by this. Mr. Ledesma. Thank there's you. There's no further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries. That had no reflection on your fourth string status on that, <laughs> by the way. Back to the bench, please. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Item 11 is consideration of Resolution 16-56, approving the application for Youth Soccer and Recreation Development Program grant funds for Bright Park improvements. And Resolution 16-59, approving the Bright Park Master Plan Improvements Mitigated Negative Declaration and Mitigation Monitoring and Reporting Program and other actions to implement Bright Park improvements. Ms. Michael. Good evening, Mayor Cabal and members of the Council. Tracy Michael with the Parks and Recreation Department. I'm very pleased to be presenting information to you tonight um, for your consideration in submitting a grant application for funding for Bright Park improvements, along with a series of other actions for your consideration to comply with the grant requirements. So what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about the grant. This is a unique one-time funding opportunity from the State of California Parks and Rec Department. Their Office of Grants and Local Services is the one making the Youth Soccer and Recreation Development Program available. The objective of the grant is to foster development of new youth recreation opportunities in underserved communities. The grant funding statewide is um, 26 to 27 million dollars. The maximum grant request is a million dollars per project site. There is no minimum request amount. 
and the grant deadline is November 1st. So the grant uh, does require that the scope of work include new youth recreation opportunities, so it can't just be refurbishment of an existing type of youth recreation facility. For purposes of this grant, recreation is defined as soccer, basketball, baseball, or softball, only those sports. You also have to demonstrate a 30-year property control from the date the grant's awarded and the anticipated award dates, um, July of 2017. I included a list of the grant evaluation criteria only to highlight that demographics and community challenges are the top two categories. They assign the most points to the evaluation process, which is important in um, considering which site to focus on for the grant improvements. Bright Park provides a lot of opportunities as it relates to the grant requirements and the evaluation criteria, the demographics in the Bright Park uh, neighborhood are well aligned with the target populations for the grant. The, there's a focus on um, looking at areas with high youth crime and over the past two years, which is the time period we're looking at for a lot of the statistics that go into the grant application, 44% of youth crime that occurred in the city was in beat one, which includes the Bright Broderick neighborhood. We already have a master plan in place for Bright Park that creates that roadmap for future improvements and um, the entire city uses Bright Park. So not only do we have an opportunity to make improvements that will benefit the local neighborhood, but also provide citywide benefits. We also have a track record at Bright Park of completing projects. We had the Disney Kaboom project completed recently. Um, we have phase two improvements underway, and it also demonstrates our capacity to work with the school district on our on joint projects. And that also is one of the challenges with this with this grant opportunity is that the property is owned by the school district and we have a current joint use agreement in place with the district, a 20 year agreement and that was approved in December of 2015 so we actually have less than 20 years left on that agreement. To be eligible for this grant we need to apply for an amendment to that or we need to amend that agreement. So just an um, uh, update on Bright Park. As I mentioned, the Disney Kaboom play area was completed along with new sidewalks, concrete curb, drainage, new ground covering, and fencing along Cary Street. Immediately adjacent to that are phase two improvements, which are anticipated to be underway in 2017. That will include a new restroom building, large group picnic area with shade, drinking fountain, on-site parking to accommodate approximately 40 spaces, lighting and landscaping, street crossings along Cary Street, and a potential new basketball court. We did include one basketball court in the phase two design work, but uh, moving forward with that will depend on the ultimate budget when the bids come back in. And looking at the proposed improvements to include as part of the grant application, we, we looked at the eligible uses, first of all. We knew we had to focus on youth recreation opportunities. We, we had a, a, a master plan, and we wanted to be consistent with the master plan. And we also wanted to look at what we could accomplish with a million dollars to make sure that we had whole recreation components that would generate the benefits that would make us competitive for the grant. We wanted to make sure that we looked at improvements that, if made, wouldn't impede other activities from taking place. So if you were to pursue something in the middle of the park right now, we wouldn't have enough money with a million dollars to make all of the improvements. So any improvement made would hinder the existing uses, which is a, a track and field area. So, um, so based on that, we are proposing two areas for improvement. The first would be on the upper left-hand corner of the, the image, new soccer fields. That is consistent with the Bright Park Master Plan. The first field would be the largest field, uh, what's called a U19, an age 19 and under field. It's a full-size field that could also be used to accommodate 12 smaller U6 fields for the six and unders, which is really important because right now they've shifted the approach to the younger age groups for soccer. They're required to have smaller teams, which means they have more teams and they need more space for playtime. We also have a second field. It's a slightly smaller U12 field that can accommodate two U8 fields or up to seven smaller U6 fields, so providing a lot of flexibility. As part of that project, we would be removing the dated play structure and the existing basketball court and the picnic table area. 
In its place, we would also be constructing on the other side of the park two new basketball courts that would have fencing and lighting, possibly play lighting for programmed use only, and then turf replacement with water uh, conserving hybrid Bermuda, which there is a water conservation component to this grant. There is also a community outreach requirement for the grant. Um, it requires community outreach focusing on six target groups, local nearby residents and nearby businesses, community-based stakeholders and nonprofits, our public agency partners, and potential users of the park. It also requires that we report on outreach completed in the past two years. So unfortunately, a lot of the outreach that was done for the Bright Park visioning and master plan process occurred outside of that window. But out of respect for all of that outreach and, and being careful and not trying to get too far ahead of this grant application process, we came up with um, a couple of approaches for reaching out to the community. One was meeting with community organizations just to share with them this grant opportunity and to revisit the master plan in terms of making sure that the priorities established in that document were still valid. We had on-site discussions with the park users. We have been out there on Saturday mornings um, meeting with folks who are using the park. And we also created an online survey that had questions targeted for the grant, but also had some more general recreation questions that we hope to be able to use for future grant applications and our park master plan update. It's, uh, we've had the online uh, survey available for a few days now, and we have almost 400 responses so far. So we've gotten some really good feedback that validate the improvements that we are considering as part of the grant, and also the improvements that were identified in that Bright Park Master Plan. So we have also gotten feedback on some uses that are part of the Master Plan but are not eligible under this grant strong interest in replacing the existing restrooms, strong interest in a shade structure over the Disney Kaboom play area, strong interest in refurbishing the tennis courts that are located adjacent to the Club West Teen Center. In the city, we don't have publicly accessible tennis courts. You need to be a member of our rec center, and so there's an interest in having publicly accessible tennis courts. We can't, um, we can't incorporate those into this grant application, but we are working on exploring ways that we might be able to move forward with those and would like to come back to council in early 2017 with some funding strategies for those. The joint use agreement with the school district, as I mentioned, was approved in December of 2015. It had a 20-year term, no renewal options, and it actually had termination language that was um, fairly flexible. This grant application requires a 30-year term from the date the grant's awarded, so we actually would need an amendment that accommodates more than 30 years. We are proposing with the amendment to include uh, renewal options, two five-year renewal options, as well as termination language that's consistent with the grant requirements. And the grant basically wants to see, or the state wants to see, that you can't terminate without cause. So in the amendment language, we included cause language that provides an opportunity um, if, in a, if there's a material breach of the agreement, there's a 90-day cure with appropriate notice, and it also provides opportunity for the school district to notify the city with a three-year advance notice if they need to use the site for another district purpose. And when we had discussions with the school district at their last board meeting, there were some concerns raised about um, what if the district needs to use the site for another purpose in the future. They don't anticipate that at all, but in the event that should come up, they wanted to see some flexibility built into the amendment language. We have shared the amendment language with the school district and, um, and based on feedback received from council tonight, we, can, we plan to meet with them next week at their board meeting. Um, environmental, we had initial study and mitigated neg deck prepared to include implementation of the Bright Park Master Plan. So the scope of work in that document includes not only the phase two improvements that will be underway in spring, but also the improvements considered as part of this grant application. It was circulated for 30 days, minimal comments received, and we have um, included as attachments three and four, the mitigated negative declaration, as well as the mitigation and monitoring and reporting plan plan, and attachment five is the resolution uh, formally approving those documents. So for the budget, based on the scope of work and our cost estimates, uh, we think that the, um, the improvements warrant the full maximum grant amount request of a million dollars. 
Match funds are not a requirement for this grant, but if you provide them and you focus all of the grant funds on construction costs for the recreation facilities, then you receive a priority standing. So either you get zero points or you get five points. There's nothing in between. So to position ourselves to be most competitive for this grant, we are proposing match funds be, um, be approved for this grant application. We have a total project cost of a little over $1.3 million. If we receive a million dollars of grant funding, we would need city match funds in the amount of $350,000. So in summary, staff recommends approving resolution 1656, which approves the application for the youth soccer and recreation development program grant funds in the amount of a million dollars, authorizing $350,000 to be used as city match funds for the grant that would come from two sources, the West Riverview settlement funds and a not to exceed amount of 300,000 and the city ADA work order funds a not to exceed amount of 50,000. Additionally, we recommend authorizing the city manager to approve amendment one to the city school district joint use agreement and substantially the form presented and also approving resolution 1659 which is approving the, the mitigated negative declaration and the mitigated monitoring and reporting plan for bright park master plan improvements and that concludes my presentation all right then with the staff presentation concluded are there questions or comments from council yeah, I do. Tracy, um, what if the school district doesn't uh, cooperate, and how how does that work? We are, then we are not eligible for the grant. Okay, so no monies would be appropriated, or no monies would be spent um, unless the school district moves forward. Correct. And they had some issues or they had some concerns when you first presented this to them. Um, what were those, what were the issues other than future use or something else? There was general support to move forward with the grant application to, um, you know, have this level of investment to leverage resources to make improvements in Bright Park. But the, the concerns that were raised were just to make sure that the, um, that the termination language you know, provided uh, enough flexibility for the school district at some point in the future that if they needed to terminate for cause, they could. And that was, that was really the, the major issue that was raised in our discussion with the board. Uh, was it brought up that they would, if there's matching funds that are required for the $300,000 that each entity could put in uh, we'll say 150. We did not discuss that. Okay. 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 Thank you, Mr. Ledesma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, Tracy, for the presentation. I think um, you know this is a general comment and a couple of questions around the opportunity of the of the grant. First of all, we're all, I'm glad we're always looking. We found this grant that came, became available, but the, the nature of it is. Is it really as narrow as for soccer, basketball, and I missed one, softball? Baseball. Baseball, yeah. baseball and softball, right? So is it, is, is it really have to stick to that? Now, now I know based on the, the Bright Master Plan that we had contemplated, there was soccer fields to kind of re-align re them and making sure that the, you, you know, they were being used for soccer anyway, so making sure that there was a, was a realignment. So this fits into that scope, but it, it, it has to be very tightly used for those types of purposes, correct? It does. We had a technical meeting with the state to clarify that, and um, they highly suggested that not only do we focus only on those those sports, okay. but that we we don't even request to use the grant funding for support services like or support improvements like restrooms. They wanted to see all of the grant funding go towards those specific recreation activity improvements. Which leads to my second question, which is, you know, my, my girls are a little older now, but when they were playing soccer there, there was, the, it's, a, it's already intensified use because of all the soccer that goes on there, and certainly we know the bathroom situation, but one of the other areas that we've been, we've heard about in the past is just the parking area, which I know was 
again, part of the, the, the master plan sort of contemplated. Um, so while I'm supportive, kind of, we, we, like this is what we had always talked about doing, is being able to leveraging funds we have, and, and it's gonna have to, we're gonna have to kind of take the implementation of the Bright Master Plan as we get it. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a opportunity to go up to a million dollars, I think, of funding for this, which we've, I think we're gonna try to max out. Um, it's just we can't forget those other uh, intensity. I, I know you've articulated the other, the, the restroom and everything else that are on the, I just worry that as we, you know, as, as let's not forget that was part of it too for the, for the neighbors in the area. Um, who, you know, parents are parking wherever they can park to get their kid to the soccer fields on time, um, which, which is, it's a great amenity, but we're going to have to kind of keep our eye out for other opportunities to fund that as well. So that's the only question I had. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Johanneson? I, I just have a comment. And, um, I can make, oh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to, to emphasize, I know there's a lot of folks that are looking at uh, the groupie money, you know, over the course of time, we've talked about how to how we can use that to do more with that money than just what's in that fund. And so, this is an example of using potentially just three hundred thousand of those funds for a one point three million dollar project. So, and I know more of these are going to be coming along, but um, I think that's uh, it bears to be emphasized. Mayor Pro Tem Sandine. Thanks, and that was a great segue because my question is actually about the, the balance of the groupie, groupie fund. So if, and I know we were just given a memo on this, but how much does that, what's the balance then that we would have to leverage, potentially leverage or use? If we use the full 300,000, which is a not to exceed amount, so our goal is to try to get under that if we can, right. you still have 2.358 million left. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the, the 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 comment and the question on that. Because the uh, is is your estimate of the three hundred and fifty uh, conservative in terms of what's necessary to get the five points? Is that I mean, would we have a good chance at the five points with two hundred and fifty, or had, did you get pretty clear message from the state that three hundred and fifty would be the? No, it's not about the dollar amount. It's about how you're using the grant funds. So when we looked at how we could max out the million dollars in hard construction costs that just that put us over a million for total project costs. So we 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 may need less than three hundred and fifty thousand at the end of the day, but based on our cost estimates and trying to be conservative, um, we felt that that was a number that you know we could move forward with and feel good about. Um, it's if you if you try to get that number down. What we have to do is then look at the two components of the grant application. And it costs almost a million dollars just to do the soccer component. So you could, you could omit the basketball courts, but what's hard about that is to make the soccer improvements, you're eliminating the existing basketball court. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to have a project that creates new opportunity at the expense of another opportunity. So that's it's just that's kind of where the numbers landed. Okay, no, that makes sense. I, I, I'm, I'm just I, I'm hawkish about making sure we have as much money in the fund to match future opportunities because this is a fantastic one and it's exactly what we were hoping to accomplish with our strategy with the with the funds. And so we just we want to we make sure we have the opportunity to finish out the master plan. Right. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, so 2.3 million dollars left is still substantial, but it's not even at these rates. Actually, it's not enough for us to complete the whole master plan. So um, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to hit more of these and get even, even a better ratio in the future in order to, to build out the whole the whole part. But this this is fantastic work. Um, both I mean, identifying it for sure, but the just the the, the analysis, the work, the, the actual project. Um, uh, is is really outstanding, and it's a good use of. The, I, mean, I mean, it's 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 very smartly tailored to the application. So I'm glad you showed us the points and all of that, um, and the emphasis on you know the that a lot of what we do in the city is going after the winnable opportunities, even if it's not the number one thing that we want to see. I mean, it may it may be that the the shade structure on the on the on the playground on the Disney play area is a more important. Than uh, one additional soccer field, it may be that that it is the case, um, but that's not fundable. Um, so it's better to apply for the money that we can get, and keep keep biting away until we get until we get to our the big objectives. That's how that's how most of our successes have happened. So I appreciate the the both the focus in that way and also the transparency about how that how that uh, has been 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 done. Um, 
and also the, the approach that you're taking on outreach. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've said this a few times. I, 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 I hate going back to, back to people and saying, so what, would, what do you think should happen at Bright Park again? You know, when we just asked them two years ago and two years before that, two years before that, and just create, it reinforces the idea that my, my feedback doesn't really matter because you're just going to come back with something new. And uh, so I, I can see you've made every effort to try to frame the, the mandated outreach in a way that, um, uh, that begins with and builds off of and respects, as you said, the, the significant work in going back to the Brighton Broderick um, visioning process that we did a decade ago um, through, the, through the master planning process. If we didn't have the master plan, it would be hard to, we wouldn't be able to do these kinds of projects. Um, uh, and I think it is important for folks in, who've, who've worked so hard on that, on that plan to realize that in the absence of a master plan, I mean, other communities can't apply for this money because they don't know what they, they don't know what they want to build, how much it costs, what it would take to maintain, and we do because we have a complete master plan that brings it all together. Um, and then uh, Mayor Pertem Sandine and I both, we talked about this with the school trust, school board trustees at the last two by two meeting and uh, just want to acknowledge the super, the strong support for this from the superintendent. Uh, Linda Luna and from both of the trustees that are on the two by two, uh, Katie Viegas and Sarah Kirby Gonzalez, who at that meeting, after hearing your presentation, um, were very strongly committed to advocate for 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 this at the at the board. Uh, of course, we you know as we we are a board that also controls property and and I think we understand. I mean that we've we've had issues where we've agreed to uses of property that we and we don't want to we don't want to agree to you know let somebody use one of our pieces of property on say third and C for a parking lot forever. You know, we want the ability, we you, you ought to have the ability to make sure that if it's necessary for us for a future police station or something that we have the ability to accomplish that. And for them, if for whatever reason their enrollment skyrockets uh, in the bright neighborhood that they have and they have a, and they have to build a new school that they shouldn't have to go buy another piece of property. So it's, it's a reasonable set of questions for them to be asking. Um, but the amount of progress that's been made with the board as a whole, I think is, Reflective of the, of their of their of their collective support for the project for our for our for our joint work on Bright Park overall and so I, I um, as we pr proceed I hope you know the city manager will continue to and we will at the two by two as well but to con to communicate um, our appreciation for their uh, for their enthusiasm and and it, and, not, not, uh, and willingness to keep collaborating to try to uh, you know brute force these improvements one at one at a time and, and doing what it takes quickly in order to to be competitive for these outside funds. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, is there a motion? Mr. Johannesson? Mr. Mayor, I'll move the uh, staff's recommended action. Second. Okay. It's been moved by Mr. Johannesson and seconded by Mr. Kristoff. Uh, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed, hearing none, motion carries. Thank you very much. Item 12 is consideration of a workshop on parking strategies for the Bridge District. Mr. Doherty. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, Chris Doherty, Public Works Department. Uh, the item before you, uh, in front of you this evening, um, Chris, sorry, sorry, um, is a workshop on the parking strategies for the Bridge District. When the initial developments in the Bridge District were, were constructed, the projects were allowed to meet some of their parking requirement on street uh, to incentivize development. Uh, this was intended to be a short-term solution until uh, the parking, until new parking facilities were constructed in the district. To facilitate the on-street parking, the city enacted the Residential Permit Parking Program, Area C. This allowed city staff to track and manage the on-street parking spaces associated with these developments. The nature of residential parking is that it is long-term storage of vehicles um, overnight and for long periods of time. While this strategy met the early needs of the, the, the developing district, uh, this has left uh, limited availability for short-term parking for the emerging commercial and bridge uses in the, in the bridge district. To address this issue, staff is recommending a multi-pronged approach to transition the on-street parking from the long-term residential vehicle storage uh, to short-term parking that serves the current and future commercial uh, uses in the bridge district. These recommendations, there are three recommendations in front of you. Uh, the first one is to uh, allow the residential permit parking program area C to expire when it naturally is supposed to expire in March 31st of 2017 and to not renew the permits. And uh, 
to concurrently finish the construction of a new interim surface parking lot uh, on the Weyerhaeuser parcel uh, at 5th and Bridge Street. Staff is currently working um, to process and design that project. Uh, item two of this evening's consent cal calendar item um, addressed the need to expedite the, uh, the, the building and the design of that, of that parking lot. If any anticipated, unanticipated, excuse me, uh, delays occur in the construction of the parking lot, staff will return to city council to seek uh, direction for uh, interim solutions. Highlighted in red here would be the location of the, the warehouse or lot. The second recommendation is to re-sign the remaining streets to the following. Uh, Garden Street, here highlighted in yellow, uh, would be uh, reverted or would be just two hour parking, uh, but removed the exemption to the um, residential permit parking permits. Uh, and then would also, it would be then free parking from 10 p.m. at night until 8 p.m. in the morning, unrestricted parking. Uh, the remainder of the streets here highlighted in purple uh, would be limited to 90 minute parking uh, and then would be um, unrestricted again from 10 p.m. until 8 a.m. And then the uh, to deploy parking meters throughout the district, uh, mostly in the areas of purple. Um, staff is still researching the type of parking meters and the, the type of um, meter itself that we would that would best suit the city's needs. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, regimes and hardware available uh, right now, uh, and we anticipate that we'd be coming back to city council at a later date with uh, more information to make that decision. And the final recommendation uh, is to uh, ensure that there's a proper mechanism for visitor parking for the residents of the area to um, remove the current visitor pass regime that we are using and move to a self-print program uh, that would allow the residents in the area to use a visitor pass as, as they need to, but also for the city to monitor and make sure those are not being overutilized and, and undermanaged. So this concludes my presentation this evening. I'm available for any questions you may have. Right. Are there questions at this time? I'm pointing out we're, we're, we're dealing with this in the in the bridge district. This is a, this is a, uh, uh, largely though our, our first um, on the ground implementation of our entertainment zone um, parking. You know, how to deal with parking in the new development areas that don't have that that um, are that aren't where there's not four car garages and four car driveways. Um, uh, that, but 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 are not uh, subject to residential permit parking because they're they're not they, they they didn't exist prior to the to the uses that are generating parking demand. So uh, the, what we're trying and part of, part of part of what this effort is is trying to figure out what the, what's the right regime for Pioneer Bluffs and for um, and for other parts of the entertainment zone as well. But this is the one that's live, Mr. Ledesma. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks, Chris, for the presentation and, and bringing this back. First of all, on the recommendations, these aren't these aren't the way they're presented, these aren't separate of each other. There's three ways to view parking concurrently. They could be correct, just to clarify. Yeah, each, each recommendation can stand on its own, but correct. they work very well together, together. as one regime um, to be implemented at one time. Right, and I think it's just the, the nature of how it's presented makes it sound like you have one of three choices, when in fact we want all three, We right? So, correct. But, but, or we may want all three, but which which is I what I want actually. So I, I appreciate the the work on this. I know we talked about this a few weeks ago and sort of laying the groundwork of what this what this might mean because it has been a bit confusing for residents and um, and and maybe our approach to the parking while early into the bridge district's uh, formation and build out. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to send, trying to, to get the right uh, balance of accommodating um, residents and their visitors, while also make planning for uh, actual commercial activity. As, as you know, I see uh, dirt being moved in for the Rivers Edge project, and and you see other activity that's happening around the barn, and that and that and we, that's what we want. So, um, having this conversation now and being very clear about the direction we want to go as we go to implement is going to be. Uh, from uh, is going to be important on on uh, recommendation one on um, part one on this um, it's just a language thing I think we talked about this a little bit before but around the par the parking program is we're, 
we're just going to let those expire. There's there's not even opportunity to renew. Um, so it's just that program ends, and then we're going to go forward with a new program, so to say, right? Correct. Okay. And then on the um, the surface parking, I think at one time with the 255 spaces we'll have there, and residents will be able to residents and visitors will be able to, to have parking opportunities in that lot. It's just a public lot, right? It's just a very city-run public lot. But will there will there be opportunities for residents to you know reserve a spot? Will there be reserve spacing in there? Would that be is that? Yeah, we could we could uh, with the we could build a regime where the residents could definitely reserve a spot in there. Plus, um, it'll have sufficient parking for um, short term uses as well. Okay. But with the availability of all the street parking around there, also ideally metered, um, would free up all the needed parking for that area, uh, at least for the short term. Okay. But if I could, I mean, to clarify, that's a paid parking lot, so that'd be for hourly and, and no, if I, somebody get it. No, I, I understand. Okay. Yeah. It, it, I, I understand that part. I just want to make sure that residents that are that maybe are paying for that in advance or whatever, that, that, that they have that opportunity because if there's a big event going on, then, you know, do they have a spot that they can get back to? Um, on, on the other part, of, and, and, and uh, uh, part two of this, um, the the 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. Um, available time, and, it, and I think I asked this question before, but it's consistent with what occurs um, on uh, on typical urban parking. It's just open. We I know the city of Sacramento is now going paid park until I think it's 10 o'clock now. Correct. Yeah. So we're being consistent so that there's no from an experience standpoint, it's similar, right? Yeah, we are. We chose the 10 o'clock. Um, um, level because of the river cats parking around there we didn't want it to affect the river cats parking in the in the lots okay but yeah to have it um, to have it unrestricted overnight is very similar to other regimes in other urbanized areas okay and then um, on, on item three I think you're, as we get into um, the visitor passes and and the opportunities to um, self print the self print system that that presents um, how, I mean, uh, uh, again, I'm kind of thinking I'm not, it's, it has to work for everybody. And so the, how the self printing will work, I mean, technically how will it work? I mean, well, you go online and you, pr you produce it and it goes to, you, you actually have to print something at your home to get the pass. Correct. There are a couple different ways of doing it. Uh, the, the, the way that I've been testing uh, currently, uh, you, you log in, uh, your login is associated with your address, so it knows how many it's issued to that address, and you can self-print a piece of paper and put it in your dashboard. Mm -hmm. And that's good for a 24-hour period and expires in 24 hours. Okay. And, for, and, and is there an alternative way to get those passes? Do we come to City Hall to get them? For those that may not have a printer, that's what I'm thinking of too. Sure, we could make some accommodations for that. I just want to we make sure we could put a kiosk uh, at, at City Hall or something okay. to that effect. Okay, those are my only questions for now. But thanks for bringing this back, okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Johanneson. Yeah, just to follow up with uh, Councilman Rodriguez on the on the self printing, uh, are there safeguards against forgeries? Um, creating your own and sticking it in your day. I don't know. You know, if that's going to be an issue. But it seems like there's. Um, some issue there unless there's a, a scan or uh, something that someone could confirm that it's original yeah we could look into that to see if there's some kind of unique code that could be scanned to see if it's been been duplicated yeah I mean I, I don't know if that's gonna that. be an issue but you know if it's a 24-hour pass yeah. why not try and create one Mayor Pro Tem Sandine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the report. I um, I know when we were talking about parking in this area we we knew that there we knew we were going to come back and look at it, and we knew that, that we we're going to learn from kind of organically watching what was happening. So um, I, I don't feel uncomfortable. You know, I'd like, I would like, as, as uh, Councilmember Ledesma mentioned, I would like for us to come to some resolution so that it can be kind of understandable and, and that we, we've gotten the best solution that can last for some time. I just have just a couple questions to understand the kind of extent of the problem we're solving. Um, and one is how, how many permits are there now um, residents because I'm if there are more than 255 we might have a problem I don't know if we how many we are out there right now so right now with the visitor pass system we have in play there are approximately 
150 hard permit stickers have been issued. For and those are for residents? Those are for residents. Okay. And then we've issued uh, approximately 150 more visitor passes. Okay. But so we don't know if those are being used daily or if they're being used in their intended fashion. Okay. So we assume it would be approximately 155 spaces for residential demand right now. That demand, as this area gets more dense and more urban, will diminish. But uh, so out of the 255 spaces in the warehouse or lot, figure 150 would be used pretty much for monthly parking at this time. And it's potential that people could find some of some of the residences actually have garages that might get cleaned out so that people don't have to pay for the monthly pass or something like that could happen. So there may not be the demand that's there right now because now it's, you just get it. Correct. Uh, okay. The, the, the housing units like the Park, Park Moderns, uh, with the exception of seven of them, are not eligible for passes now. Okay. So they're, oh, not, okay. they're not in this pool. Um, the only exception are the seven larger units that do not have a driveway that have been uh, issued visitor passes because they have no other means for right. guests. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I just was, again, was just trying to understand the if we're actually solving enough of the problem or if there's not maybe a bigger one coming. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, those are, those are all, I mean, obviously I, I, I see it uh, very clearly, but, uh, you know, from, from being there, but the, I, I mean, we approved, I mean, we're here, I mean, for all, you know, all the comments are, are correct and we're, we're learning, um, and this is a good uh, test area for, for the broader entertainment zone and for what we're doing in, in Pioneer Bluffs and elsewhere. Um, but we're, I mean, we're here because we appro the council approved and the planning commission approved um, a, a significant reduction in the parking requirements for the homes and the apartments. And, and Mr. Christoph was the first one to say, I, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> people, you know, uh, they're they're going to need more parking. People are going to want to park. And, uh, people are parking at higher, at significantly higher rates than was anticipated in the land use approvals. And that's not sustainable for the, for the, for the neighborhood. Um, uh, not even close. And, uh, you know, there, and, and, and there were, uh, lots of uh, bad incentives have been created as a result. And I think as we said in that September meeting of last year, that the residential permit parking program was not, was, it was created in 1980, uh, I'm sorry, 1996 or seven, I think. 96. Um, and it, but it was created for the purpose of ameliorating the impact on street parking in an existing neighborhood from a project um, that invades, essentially. So you buy, you buy a home and you, you create your lifestyle, you're living on Clarendon um, or Meadow or somewhere near the high school, and then suddenly, uh, near, near the school, and then suddenly the school district uh, c uh, converts it into a high school and doubles the enrollment, and now there's a million people parking on the street, and, but your whole, you know, the house has been in your family for two generations, what are you supposed to do? And so that was what the residential permit uh, parking was created for, not for a situation in which you're moving to a brand new area and making a choice to live there based on the parking regime that is there, right? So, so it was not really the right, the right use of the residential permit, permit parking program in the first place. And uh, we have situations where folks have, you know, four, two, three, four, five cars per household, um, or where they're not, they're not purchasing, uh, uh, they're not leasing a parking space in their apartment building because it's cheaper to just get a permit from the city and park on the street. Um, so it's it's you know we're everyone's learning and everyone's adapting, um, inc including people who want to park. So uh, I know that a lot of work has gone into into trying to you know continue to improve this and get it to a point where it can be um, send the right signals and, and create the right incentives and not, then also have enough clarity um, and 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 at least viability for more than six months to be a real a real program that folks can can understand. So. Uh, just, uh, the, uh, I think one of the, uh, I was just going to, in terms of a question, maybe, maybe it's not a question, but the unrestricted parking in the evenings, and you, you've raised this, Mr. Doherty, before, the 10 o'clock time does pose a problem because um, uh, to the extent which if, if you can park there for 90 minutes um, without, rest without restriction, that essentially means you have an 8.30, at 8.30 you can park. Um, and uh, so for, for quite a few uses that are still happening at 8.30, whether it's a River Cats game or, or an event at the barn um, or a party at the urban beach at the River's Edge project, um, it, that, will, that has the potential to create some significant uh, demand problems on, on, on the street parking, which is why the, uh, I, that, that's only ameliorated if there are meters, 
Right, so I think that, that you know the, the the recommendations around continuing to to proceed to, to to work on meters. If you have meters, then you have an effective parking control all the way up until 10 o'clock, and so it has a, it does uh, ameliorate that problem. All right, we did have one request to speak on this item, so of course we're going to have to just ask you to step away and uh, invite Maria Grijalva to the podium. My que <clears throat> My question my question that I can dissolve? Okay, you hear I think my voice carries well. It does, but we want to make sure folks at home can hear you on TV as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, please, just stop doing that. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. It is still green. Okay. So the residential parking permit program is my understanding that people are paying for parking permits in their own homes. Is that, it, uh, I think that's my understanding from what I, I just heard or what I was told. But anyway, I wanted to go on record as saying that I was here uh, 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 just 15, 20 minutes ago, I came in here early on time so I could be on, on uh, record to go on uh, to talk about item number 11, Parks and Rec, because you said yourself the groupie funds are controversial, okay? And so when apparently when I got here and, um, and I stepped outside with the community members that were concerned, you skipped all of this and jumped straight to 11 while I was outside. I wanted to go on public record that I did not get an opportunity to comment on item number 11, which is contr com completely controversial. It's my understanding, and that was part of what I was going to ask you, is if it's true that 65% of the phase one construction uh, so ones we're, went we're, towards we've a... We've completed with that item. We're now on item 12. Isn't that convenient so, for you? Well, uh, did you no. know I worked for the state for... All right, I, I, uh, I regret that you are unfamiliar with the council's procedures or the rules that we announce at the beginning of each meeting and they're posted on our agenda. Um, uh, but it is the standard practice of the council. We may have to vacate the room at, at a, in a moment, but the, it is the standard procedures of the council. It has been for several years, for more than a decade, with respect to the speaking times. So those who were, in, who were present at the time of the meeting had the opportunity to speak. Uh, and we did not receive a speaking request in time for that for that component. So anyway, uh, we had no further requests on item 12. So are there any further discussion or questions on the parking item? All right, is this is a workshop only, no motion required, correct? Yep. All right, thank you very much. Uh, council calendar, Ms. Berlin. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. Here are a couple of, uh, only a couple of Yes, let's, let's, let's stick to highlights, please, this time. Yes. <laughs> um, coming up on October 14th, uh, Friday, there's the Village Parkway uh, North Grand Opening. That starts at 10 a.m. And then on Monday, October 17th, we have the retirement party for Council Member Kristoff at 5.30 in the Galleria. And then finally, um, October 24th through 28th, this flood preparedness preparedness week and there will be an event um, at some point during that week the data is still being worked out but we'll provide more information <laughs> as that's forthcoming all right any questions on the calendar seeing none city manager report uh, mayor and council members at the last meeting we reported the word of bill uh, 
uh, was approved by the Senate. It, last uh, Friday, it was approved by the House on a 399 to 25 vote. And so now that bill, which includes RGRR for our levy project, is uh, going to the President for his, his, for his consideration. Um, the Y shuttle, uh, Councilmember Ledesma did not mention it in his comments, but the Y shuttle was operating last night. Uh, uh, went very smoothly. The ridership was light, but we're monitoring it tonight in the next uh, several or events at uh, Golden One Center to see how that goes. Uh, on our end, there's no traffic problems reported uh, to this point. And then finally, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sandine mentioned the Business Journal uh, Awards in addition to Park Moderns. The uh, Firehouse did get the award. The latest is we hear that Burgers and Brew will open uh, for business uh, middle to the late of next month. All right, any questions on the City Manager report? City Attorney report? Staff direction from members of the council? Seeing none, we have no future agenda item requests. So is there a motion to adjourn? Mr. Johannesson moves and Mr. Ledesma seconds that the council be adjourned. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Meeting is adjourned.